Okay, hello everybody. This is John O'Landon, and we are just about to get started. Uh, so we're going to be talking about how to use Facebook ads to increase enrollment. It's going to be, uh, you know, um, uh, it's going to be a case study. Um, uh, we're going to talk about some general topics about enrollment marketing, but also going to show you some information based off, uh, you know, an actual uh, Montessori enrollment campaign that we've run. Uh, we run a lot of these for different clients and we've learned a lot of things. You'll be able to take this information and go apply it to your own campaigns or hand it off to, you know, uh, uh, maybe a parent volunteer that you have or anything like that. Um, just really important information, things that you might not, you know, might not be obvious. <clears throat> um, you know, we've been doing this for a while and we've learned a lot over the time. Things that, uh, you know, have surprised us uh, about learning how to engage with with prospective parents, um, you know, so there's a few different components that we're going to dig into. Number one, it's, uh, you know, just there, there's, uh, you know, what should the ad say, the type of, uh, you know, copywriting and the presentation, how you want to go about figuring out that copywriting. Also, um, you know, uh, there's a few different components to uh, campaigns that, <clears throat> that, that you have to, that you have to work on and, and, continue to test over time. So there's the design of the ads. There's also the targeting. Uh, that's just as important as the ad design. Sometimes it's even more important depending on your area or the, you know, the little demographic changes for, you know, where you're located. And, um, and there's also uh, the actual web pages that people enter, enter in, sorry, engage with after they click on your ad. So, um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to I'm going to kick off the uh, the presentation. Um, so, if you take a look at this picture, just uh, consider if this looks familiar, if you can relate to it at all. We've got paper, calendar, and binders, and some piles of money, and uh, but there's this computer there sitting sitting beside her that could actually manage all the same types of tasks, um, and with the right software and the right the right knowledge of how to use it well it could really do everything in the fraction of the time and the hassle, especially if you're using software that can automate processes um, so that you can remove multiple steps of the sort of the busy work of, of the admissions process, which can be really time consuming, especially when you're handling a lot of paper. Um, so I wanna say uh, you're in the right place if, if you wish that relying of word of mouth marketing referrals was enough anymore but you know that it's not we've we've moved past that it still does uh generally for most schools um result in the majority of their enrollment but a lot of schools are finding that it's just not enough anymore to get to capacity or hit the actual enrollment goals uh that the school needs to operate properly and when you want to fill your school to capacity and you have a waiting list that's always filling up so that's another goal that you could have and you're in the right place if if that's your goal and you'd like to spend more time on higher value tasks like face-to-face -face conversations with parents and children and i'll put staff in there as well uh teachers and other staff and uh and you need to create some margin in your day to be able to do that and uh, and you're in the right place if you find the the busy work the many many steps it takes to manage enrollment and other processes pull you away from maybe those higher value tasks that you would like to get to. So today, private schools really need to be more, more competitive and, com you know, and competitive is sometimes, you know, the word we don't want to use. We don't want to think of other schools as competition, but I'm a business guy and I'm going to be presenting this from a very sort of business standpoint. Um, so if I come off of a little bit too Trump Trumpian, uh, you know, uh, I'll apologize uh, up front, but yeah, I want to, I want to really focus on the Montessori as a business. And if you're a nonprofit, that's still, still really the same thing. So whether you're generating profit as a private school, or you're just looking to generate a better net margin, um, I think in both cases, everybody's just reinvesting it back into the school. So, you know, it's all for the same purpose to educate more kids. Um, so, uh, so what's happening in the market is, uh, the the actual increase of the size of the market. Um, so this is so if the graph on the left is talking about the overall market size in regards to tuition dollars in the U.S. 
But what's actually happened uh, as a bigger scale, uh, it's actually another graph I don't have here, but the market size has increased by 25% in the last 25 years. So um, at the same time, uh, U.S. private school enrollment rates have been going down and they're forecasted to go down more. And that's a direct result of the competition that's increasing. Today, schools are noticing that we've got, you know, a lot more competition. And what used to work essentially to, to fill this, keep the school full, meaning just having a great school and the word of mouth um, did the job to keep the school full with a good wait list over the last 10 years or so. A lot of schools that we talk to really across the board are having this challenge now that it that doesn't work anymore. And what used to just work sort of on its own now, to, meaning keeping the, the, the school full, is now becoming a challenge. And the other layer of challenge on top of that is that the marketing strategies that your prospective parents respond to are changing, uh, you know, print advertising and the, the sort of local um you know local opportunities are less and less uh impactful because you know when people want to find something even in their neighborhood or down the street where do they go today they go straight to their phone and they look up in google or they they see ads you know i mean the demographic that you're targeting is 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 uh on facebook quite a lot so if you want to advertise to these people you really have to think about the places where they're engaging content and where they're going to find things and that's um, predominantly in digital strategies now less and less people get magazines and newspapers and they're reading mostly online today so uh, especially with the demographic of the parents that you're looking to engage so so um, unfortunately they're you know the the folks that have been running the schools um, haven't had this this kind of training so much in in the uh, in the education sector, especially in the Montessori world. Um, wonderful educators, depth, serious depth of wisdom, but understanding how to use the 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 new uh, marketing strategies, um, not just the technical side, but also strategically. I mean, it's a totally different ball game. Um, so it's uh, it's it's a real gap in the industry. So, and and the result is enrollment numbers are are decreasing, and it's just more challenging. Um, so you know, so what we want to do is uh, as a first step, when you want to actually run a very high um, highly productive Facebook campaign, what you want to do is first of all, you want to identify the families in your school right now that are the ideal fit you want to pick out those parents that are the ones you it's essentially like to clone <clears throat> and you want to survey them and you want to understand exactly how they uh, would phrase the values that they get the value that they get that their child and their family uh, gain from having their children enrolled in your school and the reason why this is so important is because the predominant gap in enrollment that people are experiencing, um, you know, the, 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 the enrollment that you don't have to work for, the ones that are built in Montessori parents, the ones that are just going to find you anyways, the ones that are going to come from word of mouth referrals, those aren't the people you need to market to. You don't need to be marketing to people that know what Montessori is uh, because they're going to find you. If you're a Montessori school and they know that they want Montessori, guess what? You're going to hear from them. They're going to find you online. They're going to show up at your school. But that's not doing the job of filling up your school anymore, generally speaking. So what you do need to find are the parents that <clears throat> are looking for Montessori and are the right fit culturally, with you know, philosophically, demographically. Like Ideally, you want parents that can pay the full tuition. Um, and those parents uh, might not know that it's Montessori that they're looking for. Uh, but they are looking for a Montessori. And those are the parents you have to figure out how to speak to and how to pull in. The way you do that is you talk to the parents that you have that are raging fans of your school and are the best parents and you love them. And you want to understand how they would naturally talk about 
your school and how much they love it and the kind of words they use and the phrases they would use. And you want to use that in your advertising. You don't want to, you don't want to focus your advertising at this stage of engaging prospective parents on teaching people about Montessori. You want to just let them know that there's this place that offers the values that they're looking for and the best way to do that so that they receive it the easiest and the most uh, simplest way is that it, it it's translated into words that they would use, not necessarily the, the Montessori uh, lingo or the type of words uh, or concepts that uh, parents who have been at your school and gone through your parent education, you don't want them to, you don't want to use those types of phrases because it doesn't really, they don't quite, they can't unwrap that. You know, what you want to do is because you want them to see an ad and immediately uh, respond to a value proposition that that they understand that's in their current language. And and that's how you want to that's how you want to write your ads and design your ads. And that's how you want to write really your whole website, your whole all of your marketing materials should be put into that language. And then, you know, when the parents are in your school enrolled going through their parent education system, you want that, that's when you, that's when basically you're training them to, you know, and, and teaching them the concepts. You want to wait at least until you're face to face with them in your school before you get into that stuff. So um, big question. So a, as you noticed, I was asking people, I was asking Sandra here, how much are you spending per enrollment? And more, and, and the way you get to that understanding is to, is to first know, how much do you spend per inquiry? And this is the metric uh, when you're running a an enrollment campaign that um, that you can track uh, really easily if you know how to set up the technology to do so. Um, a platform like Facebook makes it incredibly easy to know for every dollar you're putting into the platform, how many inquiries are you getting out of it? So. Um, so taking a, these are two different ads that we ran in a campaign and we can see that one ad was uh, generating inquiries for six dollars and fifty cents that's pretty good um, and then the other one was uh, generating inquiries for eleven dollars and sixty five cents both of those are really good because um, if you think uh, if you consider uh, the, the an enrollment to achieve to an, achieve an enrollment it generally takes about four or five inquiries before you, you know, as a ratio from inquiry, the stage of inquiry to the stage of enrollment. So let's say a student comes in, let's say your average tuition is about $10,000 a year, which I would say is pretty average across, you know, the continent. Uh, we see higher and lower, but average is about $10,000 a year. Um, so if, if we just make these numbers a little more round, if it's costing you to $10 per enrollment, then uh, and it takes four sorry ten dollars per inquiry and it takes four inquiries to get an enrollment then you know it costs you forty dollars to achieve an inquiry so if you're going to spend it and uh sorry <laughs> forty dollars to achieve an enrollment that enrollment brings in ten thousand dollars in the first year and generally speaking students stay for a few different years depending on how long your programming is uh, uh an average uh uh, revenue value of a student averages around sixty thousand dollars, so forty dollars to achieve you know a lifetime value of an enrollment of sixty thousand. That's a wonderful uh, that's a wonderful result. Uh, but you you want to know. But everyone's got you know. There's a lot of expenses, of course, and uh, there's not you know Montessori schools are not operating with the highest of profit margins. So, I mean, teachers are expensive, building is expensive, pr new programming, all this stuff costs a lot of money. So you want to be as very efficient with your advertising dollars. And if you know exactly how much it costs you to achieve an inquiry and how much it costs you to achieve an enrollment, then you can plan exactly, you, you can know when you're, when you're creating your marketing budget, exactly how much you need to achieve the, your enrollment goal. So, hey, you can look in the, you can look up, you've got this many students graduating. You've got a couple of students maybe that are moving out of the area. And, you know, uh, we, we're gonna have 10 open positions. Well, we know that we're, uh, according to our tracking, it costs us $40 to achieve an enrollment, bang. 
It's four hundred dollars that I need to invest in marketing. I put that into the system, and then I result in ten new enrollments. So it should be that easy, you know. But to create that type of a uh, of tracking that system takes some does take some uh, technical knowledge. You don't have to be a programmer, but but you do need to know how to set up the campaign the right way, and you ne you need to know how to integrate it with the website the right way, so that you can get that tracking. And that, but once it's set up, it works on its own. That's what's so beautiful about these things. <clears throat> so let's look into this case study here. This is a uh, rising scholar Montessori. Um, so this is a, a campaign over a basically a 30 day period. And um, so the, so this graph, this squiggly line graph, what it's uh, showing you is the number of conversions. So in that month, they got 30 conversions. Now, to translate what conversion means here is somebody clicked on an ad, a Facebook ad that we designed for them, and then they went to a web page, which we're going to call a landing page, and uh, and then they filled out a, a tour request form. They gave their contact information and requested to uh, book a tour for that school. So that's a really valuable inquiry. That's somebody that saw an ad about the school, about the values that the, the school offers parents and families, and of course children, and then they went to a web page that talks more about the school and uh, gives a gives that prospective parent a path towards you know, booking a tour. They, they took the action to type in their personal contact information. So they're showing a lot of trust, a lot of interest, high level of interest. So this is what we call a very qualified lead, somebody that's taken a lot of action, a lot of labor, and given uh, personal information. So when, when doing that online, when somebody will take that those actions online, you're looking at somebody that's pretty interested. That's definitely um, uh, a good, uh, highly qualified, very high value lead. Somebody definitely worth uh, taking the time to at least give a call to and maybe qualify a little bit uh, further. So, um, so with this campaign, we were generating a cost per conversion. So again, a cost per tour request of $9.86. And that is a very, very good result. And that's on average. So what we do is we run many, many different ads. We'll run up to 50 different ads at a time. Each one has a different headline and a different video in the ad and different copywriting, different call to action. We're testing different value propositions to see which ones get the more engagement. And ultimately, the average came out to $9.86 per inquiry. So, uh, and, you know, once these things work, they work. So you take the best ad and the, and the best landing page. This also comes into trying different targeting methods. And I'll, I'll break all this stuff down for you now. So um, targeting. So, so some of this stuff is going to probably seem painfully obvious. I've even, I've already talked about some of it, but number one, you want to be targeting women. Cause what we find is that about, you know, as a ratio, 95% uh, of the ads are being engaged by women over men. So that's one. And also the age demographic you want to target is between 25 and 44. And as you can see here, um, if you look at clicks, that means people that clicked on the ad, there was a hundred and well, over 300 clicks occurred in that age bracket and very few outside of that. Going forward, guys, when you run your ads, make sure, because you can do this in Facebook, you can really target down as, uh, you can get quote unquote hyper targeted. Um, it doesn't make sense to show your ads to people that aren't within this age bracket because if they do click on it, you're spending money on those clicks and uh, why not invest that money into the the age bracket that's more likely to to enroll the child um, the next thing you want to look at is interests so i'm going to give this one a little bit of uh, a background because these uh these 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 percentages here um, might seem really low like when you see 3.303 percent it's like well that doesn't seem so amazing but so what this is, is a, is, is a, a metric called click through rate. So the amount of times the ad was shown on the screen to the amount of times somebody clicked on it. So just to put this into context, if you have a click through rate of 1% and above, 
that's doing well. That's where that's where good starts, 1% and above. Now, these are the interests we were targeting uh, when we run the ads, when we're trying to connect with the right parents, right, at the right stage that have the right interests. We've got, if you notice, you know, Montessori Education and Maria Montessori is in the mix, but they're not the highest. The one that's actually performing incredibly well is early childhood education. So again, th this this interest targeting doesn't work on its own. It's a combination of, uh, you know, targeting. First of all, the ad, the ad design. Does it say the right thing? Is it speaking? Uh, is it offering the right value propositions to, you know, the people? And then you can target their their gender, their age. You can target on Facebook even if they have children and children of what ages. So um, so make sure you if you are going to set up some ads. Make sure you use these interests because across the board, they get the highest engagement for finding the right parents for for your school. Now, what I'm going to show you is um, I, I want to let you guys know that the reason why I have this slide here, I'm going to actually show something that might even make us look bad for a second. But I want you to understand what you know what process you have to go through to find and optimize and get to uh, make the campaign work really, really well. So. This is this is probably the biggest reason, or the uh, the, the most important reason why uh, digital advertising is so much better than print advertising. Okay, so check this out. <clears throat> when we first launched this campaign, the first run got only six uh, tour signups, and and that was at an average cost of forty two dollars per uh, per signup. Now. Uh, as we already shown you, we were getting to about a ten dollar per sign of average, but we didn't start there. We got there after after a lot of work. So so we you know forty two dollars is not that great. We knew we could do better. So what we did is we um, you know we took a look at all the different variations of the ads, and we we uh, wanted to test it further. We wanted to you know take the parts that are working, make some other variations of those. And so what happened was uh, we, our second run of the campaign, what we did is we went the wrong direction. We actually tried to improve it and we made it worse. We actually got zero conversions. So we knew we went the wrong direction. And, and oftentimes I want you guys to know if your campaign fails out of the gate, that does not mean that it's not working. It means that you have to test more. So we actually went the wrong direction, but now, by doing so, and oftentimes, you actually have to break something to understand how to make it better. And that's exactly what happens. It's the same thing with marketing. So you need a platform that allows you to track, test different elements, break it. And then that, uh, that by breaking it, you can clearly see what's not working. That allows you to come back. So in campaign number three, that allowed us to return to what was working okay on the first campaign. And then we knew what wasn't working on the second campaign. And then we knew exactly how to improve uh, the campaign to make it run much, much better. And now we've got 33 conversions, 33 signups in the same time period for uh, about $10 each. That's how this goes. And I talk to a lot of people and they say, you know, they tried a Facebook ad, it didn't get anywhere. Well, I mean, so that doesn't mean it wasn't good or you couldn't have got there by, by trying other things. But at the same time, to be able to test, and you have to be tracking. So you do have to have it connected the right way uh, with the tracking uh, code and stuff like that on your website so that you can actually uh, confirm uh, what is or isn't working. And you need a platform. And you have to understand what you're looking at, of course, with the different metrics. But um, it's very, very possible. And so the reason why I say this is an example of why digital advertising is so much better than print advertising is because you can track this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and you can make changes on the fly whenever you want. When you, when you, when you run a print ad, you, know, you, you have somebody design the ad and you stick it in a paper and you hope for the best. And by the way, you pay a lot of money up front. What's great about Facebook is you're paying only on a, you set a daily budget and you can say, I only want to spend $5 a day or $20 a day. And so if you can see daily, you run it for, let's say a week and it's like, it's not working. You can stop it, make a change and, and start it again. You can stop it and start it as many times and whenever you want, make whatever changes you want so that your ability to test and track and hone this campaign 
Um, and again, you're going to be testing the design of the ad, uh, the placement of the ad, it's targeting. You're also testing the landing page that the ad is going to because it's connected to the Facebook through the tracking pixel. And that's really key. You can't, you cannot determine um, the performance of any ad that you run if you're not tracking uh, at the point of the goal, which is after they hit the page and then sign up for the tour, that's the goal that you need to track. So you got to know how to implement that on the web page. Once you've got that, you can actually very quickly, uh, it's very, very easy in, in a matter of days sometimes to improve the performance of a campaign by, by four or 500% and sometimes even more if you know what to track and what to test. Okay, so uh, so this particular campaign, this was the result. So guys, take note. Look at look at the wording. Um, look at how things are phrased. This this uh, this copywriting came out of again uh, surveying the parents, understanding what their uh, what what value they're looking for uh, and value they were getting from that school. Again, we surveyed parents of that school that the school told us were um, you know. The, the the awesome parents and we we uh created this uh this ad based off their feedback and this is um this was a result the the campaign i just showed you um we, again we had about 50 versions of of the ad and we had about five versions of that landing page this is the web page we're going to call a landing page and um very important point a landing page is really just a web page but it's a web page with very specific design rules. So something I want to point out because you should not, if you're going to invest in a, in an ad, you should not just send them to your homepage on your website. You need to create a specific web page for every campaign that you run. Uh, because if you want to be able to track it, the performance of the campaign, you want to make sure that there's only one goal on that page. There's only one thing for, for that person that clicked on the ad, when they come to the page, there should be only one action they can take that will allow you to really track the performance of that campaign. The action here is to fill out the form to request a tour. Now this page scrolls and there's a whole bunch of information on there. Uh, something you wanna keep in mind is you want a good landing page design. You wanna have just enough information just the right amount of information. So one thing I'll, I'll just I'll just let you know is that um, if you don't have enough information, what we find is that uh, if you don't have some program information on that page, you'll get a lower um, lower rate of of uh, inquiries. So you want to make sure that you're speaking to um, the same value propositions that that the people saw in the ad. That way, there's a high relevance. You want to have a high relevancy that'll help the ad perform. It'll help the campaign perform better. So whatever ad you're going to test multiple ads, right? And you're going to test different value propositions, whatever ads you find perform the best, obviously you're going to keep running those ads, stop running the ones that don't perform as well. And then once you have that information and you understand, uh, you know, you want to try to use the same language on the ad and then place that onto the landing page as well. There's a lot of things to test on the landing page. Could be the uh, you know the value proposition. You want to make sure it's matching up with the ad that's getting the best engagement. Um, where the button is, you know, you can get into you know the the number one thing is the value proposition. What are you promoting, and why are you you know why are you basically suggesting the parents should come learn about the school? Um, secondly, then you get into design elements. Where is the button placed? Where is the form placed? Um, where where is the additional program information? Generally speaking, what we put the 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 programming information lower on the page, um, and uh, and we find that that's that's resulted in um, the highest uh, the highest ratios of signups. Um, okay, now <clears throat> after that point, once they fill out that inquiry form. Um, at that point, what you want to make sure you want to try to have a system that basically works like a self-driving car. This is what we call uh, workflow automation. Um, and so um, now there's a, there's a reason for this. And the reason is because, as I said at the very beginning, 
you know, the, the admissions process is incredibly time consuming. So if you can make it number one digital, and if you can automate the many, many steps that go in between um, every stage of the admissions process, um, of course, you can't automate the in-person interactions, but, you know, reminders about filling out an application form or to show up for a tour or to show up for an observation and all these different things that have to happen. There's all these kind of like, you know, uh, reminders and notifications and little tasks, things like that. The busy work is what I call it. Those things can easily be automated by a good uh, software platform. And there's a lot of options out there for this. And so I, I highly suggest um, taking the time either to learn how to use them or, you know, um, again, you could have a parent volunteer that's like really tech savvy and can build marketing automation systems for you. Um, you want to build these things because, man, the, the admissions process could be so busy. And, and, and also, if it's not well set up, it's really easy for, uh, you know, great prospective parents to fall through the cracks. And, uh, and then they end up at another school when they would have been a perfect match for your school. But for some reason, you know, the other school, uh, you know, that they were checking out responded to them faster and, you know, they came in and, you know, maybe they didn't even get to your school for a tour, you know, or, you know, so there's so many. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through this, this example here. Now we build these systems custom for all of our clients because everyone's got a slightly different process. I'll walk through this one. This is just in a sort of a high level example of, of what you can have. So again, at the top, they click on the Facebook ad um, or maybe they come from a Google search. If, if Google works for you in your area, they come to that landing page and they fill out the inquiry form and then boom, immediately. So if you notice the right uh, lane here is the school office, the left lane is the parent. So after they fill out the inquiry form, uh, the admissions director gets a notification and there's a record created in a database automatically. At that point, the parent uh, gets um, uh, what we call a drip sequence of emails. It could be spread out over uh, days or weeks or months. However, you know, how, whatever makes sense for, for you. But these are pre-written emails and they're gonna be customized to that parent because they're giving you their name. So it'll say, hi, Susan. Um, and you know it, it can add in their, their child's name and things like that and um, it can basically keep on engaging that parent over time so let's say they come and they fill out the inquiry form and um, you know you haven't had a chance to call them yet to uh, you know book them in for a tour well the system could actually do it automatically because every email that goes out has also has a call to action to go to the the automated tour booking calendar um, and so the the teacher, uh, sorry, the the parent selects a time um, that you've you've pre set up. Maybe you do tours every Tuesday between, you know, eleven and one, or every Tuesday and Thursday or whatever. So those are the dates that they can select. And then you know they they come in for a tour. They get automated reminders to show up. You find with when you have a system that's automatically reminding parents, they actually like that a lot. Uh, you can get reminders. Also, it can allow them to cancel. Um, so rather than just not showing up, uh, they could click cancel, you're notified, your calendar becomes free, a different parent can book that slot, and you're not sitting around waiting for a parent that doesn't show up. Um, uh, and then also, let's say they, they come in for the tour, and they're amazing, and you love them, and uh, you want them to fill out the application form, so you know the system sends them the application form, which is a digital form to fill out. <clears throat> let's say a week goes by, and they haven't filled out the application form. Well, then the system can actually send you a notification saying, hey, Susan, uh, you know, came in for a tour, was approved of the application form, hasn't filled it out yet, give her a call. So uh, then that informs you, uh, not only does it show you exactly where every parent is uh, at what stage of your process, but it also reminds you when you need to take action. So you can really rest assured that um, no one's going to fall through the cracks, no matter how busy you get, no matter how many teachers uh, you know, get sick and you're filling in in the classroom and, you know, there's a, there's five fires to put out and you just can't get back to your inquiry list. The system's going to remind you uh, of everyone that you need to follow up with and then so on. And so like, that's, that's the point of a, of a good digital automation system, uh, workflow automation. Um, so those things like reminders and tour bookings, all this stuff can be completely automated. And of course, um, this would, you know, this types of systems, 
especially at, here at Hubley, they, they work for, you know, uh, not just people that come from the ads, but you can, anybody that walks in, you can enter them into the same process uh, or they call or you get a referral. So you want to have a good automated uh, workflow to make that system, you know, and then when, when all those hundreds of little steps are automated, that frees you up to do other things. So maybe be in the classroom or maybe work on your fundraising campaign, talk to donors because you've got an extra two hours in your day because you don't have to manage these things manually and write them in and, you know, manually send reminders and all that stuff. So you want, you want to be using uh, so this is just an example of a digital form. Um, you know, digital forms are a big preference, especially for the demographic of your prospective parents. Um, they can often pre-populate a lot of the data because they filled it in earlier from the inquiry form. And, um, you know, it can kind of show the parents where they are in the process. And, uh, and you know, and then when, when digital forms are filled out, uh, there's no paperwork to, um, to have to go through and you don't have to like type things from paper into a, another digital system it's automatically put into a digital system. And, you know, uh, certainly with Hubly and other tools, you know, one system can automatically send information to another system that you might use. Um, you don't have to do these things manual. You want these things to be automated. Um, so they just have to be set up the right way. And then um, when I was talking about a, uh, you know, a, a tour scheduling system, this is um, an example of the way Hubly works. You know, they select the day that they want to come in and the different hour slots show up. And then when they select it, it sends them a confirmation and a reminder, informs you, puts it on your calendar, things like that. And again, when they cancel, again, the notifications go out to you. So, you know, it automatically updates in your, your calendar. Um, and uh, what we're looking at here is the actual inquiry uh, list from that campaign I was showing you from Rising Scholar Montessori. And uh, I had to blur out uh, their personal information, of course. But um, so this is, you know, this is what you ultimately want. So um, you want everything to come into one centralized database that's really simple to see very quickly what stage is every parent at. Um, and you can see two are not booked, two are booked, you know, et cetera. And you can click on these to sort them. It works very much like a spreadsheet, but it's a spreadsheet that you didn't have to manually update or, again, type in from a bunch of paper forms. You want these things, to, you want these updates to work uh, automatically. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick check because I've been talking straight for a long time. And um, number one, are there any questions? Go to that chat box on the right. And number two, are you hearing me? Because <laughs> sometimes I can go for 10 minutes and then I find out that the audio cut out for some, some reason. So I just want to make sure that you guys are actually hearing me. So if, so if you folks could just give me a little indication that, um, you know, you are hearing me and, uh, and, and let me know if you have any questions. If it's, uh, if it's a good time, I'll take a break and answer a question. Oh, thank you, Christy. You are hearing me. Um, good. I hope I'm not boring you too much. I'm trying to cram in a lot of information. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Okay, so I'll go on. But essentially here, um, the way a good automation system works is that you can basically just come in here. So uh, again, this is the example at Hubly. Um, let's say this, this parent uh, called in and you booked it, uh, you went into the system and booked the tour for them. Um, so this would update to tour booked. Uh, and let's say, you know, they are, uh, they come in for, you know, for the tour and you're not, or let's say you want them, but, um, you know, you have to put them on the waiting list. You could just click this and turn it into the waiting list. It'll basically, you know, one click to switch it from tour book to waiting list. And then <clears throat> they would automatically get the, the waiting list email. It's pre-written. It'll personalize to them. But you don't have to manually write all the emails and send them manually. You want the system, you know, ultimately, you should just have to go in, click here, or click there, and that's it. That's the, that's the way marketing automation and workflow automation works when it's set up properly. <clears throat> so, again, it's all about reducing the hours in your day um, from all the busy work, all the paper um, processes and the manual uh, management of every different step so that you can just go in and click when you need to and you know that they're going to get the right message um, for, for the right parent written in the right way at that stage of the enrollment process. And again, you can change these anytime. You can test different versions of the messages, see which one you know you like better. But 
um, ultimately, once it's set up, you know, and I'm not going to, you know, it, there, there's some work to get these things set up. It's not the simplest thing in the world, but it's a really good investment of your time. If you can set up something like this, then what you've got is incredible margin in your day now to focus on, you know, well, whatever you want to do, call a donor, uh, <laughs> go to go to the spa, take a longer lunch, whatever, you know, um, the idea is time. And then you also want to make sure that it's tracking every step of the way, <clears throat> pardon me. So, um, you know, with those different workflows, um, now this is the type of information that helps you over time. So let's say you've been running the system for a year or even a few months, it's going to give you some helpful um, information as to how each stage in the process is actually performing. And then, um, then you can take a look at that and you can say, whoa, wow, you know, like, um, it looks like we could, you know, do a little better at moving uh, parents from the inquiry process to the application form. Like why, why are there so few application forms coming in? Then you can look at that and you know what to work on. Maybe it's the way the email's written. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe you forgot to call somebody, you know, uh, and uh, your email's broken and you're not getting the notic notification from the system. It's like, then you can actually go and fix something. You, you want to know, you want some diagnostics to know what's working what's not working so so that you can keep things running efficiently so um yeah so uh basically at this point i'd love to ask you guys you know what what you think about all of this um you know i'm not exactly sure why y'all showed up here today but here are my guesses um you want to be able to keep your school enrolled to capacity at least uh maybe not to capacity but to uh the ideal you know, enrollment goals for your school at this time. Uh, you want to have a waiting list that's always staying at a consistent size. Remember that waiting list will shrink over time. You want to keep filling up not just enrollment, but you want to keep that waiting list up to date. And you want people continuously coming into that waiting list. Uh, you want to have enough inquiries coming in month after month so that you're not afraid to turn away parents that you know aren't really the best fit for your school. And that's so important because that's when we get into problems when we're when we don't have the enrollment numbers we need. Your back is up against the wall and you take that parent that you weren't so sure about and then they can cause problems. And when they leave, they can take some other families with them sometimes. Um, and then you want to free up your time from the boring, repetitive, you know, busy work like sorting through sheets of paper or copying things from hard to read handwriting into 10 different digital systems or spreadsheets. Uh, it's really time consuming, you know, so you if you can free if you can remove all of that time, uh, you can spend more time in the classroom, having uh, more conversations with uh, your, you know, your, uh, your donors and your, um, you know, or just uh, being able to, you know, have more just more time in your day, more margin so you can focus on programming. How about that? Um, and you know that you're capable of of doing more and you just need to get some roadblocks out of your way. Uh, roadblocks being all this busy work stuff. And and you want to give your prospective parents a communication experience that's engaging and informative. And, and it makes them look forward to enrolling their child in your school. 